Welcome to Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations. Today is Wednesday, April 15th. We're officially in the middle of April. It has officially been a month of shelter in place, I think, something like that. And here we are. We're having this conversation and we're excited about it. For those who are tuning in, you can tag us at Welcome to Manny's. And if you have a question for Ross Eustace, our special guest for the day, um, you can type it into the Q&A box at any time. We've also enabled chat again. And so my esteemed uh, operator will hopefully put in the chat box the link to become a sponsor of Manny's. We had to disable chat because the trolls were attacking us, but we think they've forgotten about us. So we're we are re-enabling chat. We really hope the trolls are not here. If you are here, a troll, please be nice. Um, Gotta watch out for the jazz trolls. They're the worst. Are there a lot of jazz trolls? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, just thank you, everyone. It's it's been an interesting day. It's been an interesting you know week for everyone. So I just want to say thank you for tuning in. Today we are joined by Ross Eustace, who is one of my closest friends and confidants, and also, more importantly, is a trumpet player in the city, a jazz musician, and is a digital projects manager for SF Jazz. So welcome, Ross Eustace. Hi. How you doing, Manny? Good to talk with you as always. I'm great. We've been on Zoom a lot recently. Uh, we Mostly have been, to play games. <laughs> I've, um, I'm eating yogurt and blueberries, which is a bit of a risk for me because I'm lactose intolerant, but we'll see what happens later on um, with that decision. Hey, Ross, <laughs> would you be down to start this conversation about the music industry in San Francisco by playing us a little something something? Sure. <laughs> uh, Manny asked for something happy, but I don't know too many happy songs. Actually, I chose this song. Uh, it's called, it's a, it's a standard. Uh, most jazz musicians and fans will probably recognize it. It's called Alone Together. And I feel like it's a very fitting title um, for kind of what we've been going through uh, and how we've been gathering kind of alone at our homes, but then collectively on platforms like Zoom and Google Hangout. Uh, so this is uh, very quickly Alone Together. Participating, if you like, <laughs> and if you're a participant, raise your hand if you appreciated some of Ross's. Um, uh, <laughs> us. Thank you so much. Thank you for raising your hands, and thank you, Ross, for starting off this conversation musically. Um, I appreciate it. So my pleasure. It feels good to uh, to play in front of people, even though I can't see them. <laughs> Haven't done that in a while. Imagine that they're all around you. So you wear two hats. You are a musician in San Francisco. You play in multiple jazz ensembles, and you also work full time at the San Francisco Jazz Center. So you are the perfect conversation person to have a conversation with about 
um, what it's like to be a, a musician in San Francisco and also what it's like to work in the music industry because you do both. So let's yep. start with the first, which is how I, how I, known, how I first know you as a musician. Um, so obviously a lot of the physical gigs are gone. Um, have you been, how have musicians been coping with this time? Uh, and what are ways in which people that play music in San Francisco have been able to uh, kind of make it work over the last couple of weeks? And what do you think the future looks like? Yeah, those are all very big questions. Um, those are three different questions, sorry. Three very, three different questions. Um, so I mean, it's, cool. it, to, to, to start, like, it's, it's been very difficult for musicians. Um, I think hopefully everybody on this Zoom call is kind of a, aware of the fact that there's no gigs right now. I mean, basically overnight, all current and future gigs until an undecided time are postponed or canceled. Um, for a lot of musicians in the Bay Area and elsewhere, that's your primary source of income. Um, not only that, it's, you know, it's, it's the thing that you kind of live for. It's the thing that keeps you sane. It's the thing that keeps you happy and balanced. Um, there's something inherently, you know, therapeutic and just, you know, balancing about, about playing in front of people and sharing that, that kind of joy and expressing yourself emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, musicians sit in a home with nothing to do and nobody to collaborate with or play in front of is is uh, probably a, me a mental challenge as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it's it's the prospects, you know, not only have, have all gigs been canceled, but there's no new gigs being booked right now. Um, and, and then past that, when things do start opening up, um, it's very uncertain what that reality will look like. Um, how how big of events can you have? How many people could come out to concerts? Um, well, music festivals happen. You know, a lot of uh, musicians who who primarily earn by performance. Um, you know, if if they're not on like a tour with a band, which obviously won't be happening anytime soon, um, a lot of them really make money um, starting kind of in the spring to the fall. Um, playing events and weddings specifically. These are kind of your breadwinner gigs. Um, these are the things that will pay your, your, you know, your rent. These are things that will pay, you know, for all your living costs, for your family. Um, you know, those have all been postponed as well. No one's going to be ha having their wedding in, you know, the next couple of months. And they are. I'd be curious to know what that looks like. <laughs> um, so, yeah, things are, things are very tough for musicians, I would say at kind of the, the low and mid tier of, you know, measuring success. I think the people at the very top, there's a lot of things in place that will continue to support them through this time. But specifically, like think like, you know, the people you hear when you go out to local music venues, mm -hmm. um, to your local bar, like these, you know, musical, you know, the venues themselves too are struggling. So it's yeah. it's the whole thing is a little bleak right now but people are trying to figure it out and adapt and, and adjust you know a lot of i've been hearing a lot of folks like there are restaurants that are doing gofundmes um and like there's a, a queer nightlife fund and drag queens are doing shows and then putting on zoom and, and twitch and then putting their uh venmo up there is there like a similar kind of like somewhat coordinated effort to support bay area musicians or how are folks uh, utilizing the tools at our disposal right now to receive fine financial support to make it through. Yeah, yeah you definitely see musicians do live streams from their house. Um, I mean, I, at this point, musicians are trying pretty much everything. Um, right. You know, the, the, the most immediate things, posting your music, asking people to, to buy your music. Obviously, the current kind of state of music consumption, a lot of people are paying for streaming platforms. And, you know, not as many people are buying direct from artists. And I think more than ever right now, it's important to, um, to support the artists directly who you actually love and listen to and, you know, give you solace and give you, um, you know, an escape from, from this thing that we're all dealing with. Um, I think musicians are also seeing that, you know, for you to do a live stream, 
um, say on Facebook, um, you're not really going to be able to compete with a lot of artists and bands that have, you know, racked up a huge following. Right. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a platform that tends to favor kind of the top, like one to 5% echelon of artists who have amassed that kind of following and can leverage it. Yeah. Um, really and then who are you streaming to? A lot of times you're streaming to your fellow musicians who are also needing to stream and make money. So it's like, yeah. You know, it's it's kind of it's it's kind of like a funny thing. It's a kind of a, a joke in the jazz world too. Like something something we joke about, but like when you're at a gig and it's like all musicians in the audience. Like, you know, it's cool to see your your friends and collaborators, but um, maybe it's not always the the best thing if if all your supporters are you know in your same situation. Well, I would just say to you that if you did a, a trumpet show or something, I would pay money to to support you and also, you know, listen to your beautiful music thing. And I bet the other people on this call or my mom. You know, <laughs> if that's something that you want or need. Um I still have a I still have a question too about you as a musician. Um you told me and maybe this is I shouldn't say this publicly, but you you were letting me know I think yesterday or the other day that Jazz Mafia is actually utilizing technology to record right now where folks do multiple tracks. Can you talk about that? And maybe how, if you're seeing other acts, bands actually continue to, to record and make music while also social, physically distancing using kind of sound technology and, and vocal track mixing? Yeah, it's something I've, I've been looking at um, pretty closely for SF Jazz as well, for Jazz Mafia. Um, it's something that a lot of musicians have been asking about. You see threads on, you know, social media platforms, people asking, trying to share information, what's working, what's not. Um, the kind of picture in picture or multiple frame kind of way of collaborating has become pretty ubiquitous at this point. I, you've seen a lot of people do it. Um, I think with Jazz Mafia in particular, we're, we're, you know, it's a logical thing to do and it allows us to continue collaborating and recording together. We all have our own, you know, home studio set up. Mine's right behind me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sync up to the same kind of, we start building the track from say drums and bass and you just start building all the parts on top of it. And then you put all the, the you know, frames, whatever you shot it on your iPhone. Yeah. Um, and then you have a audio interface that allows you to capture decent audio um, for your instrument. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at ways not only to do that, but also to do it in like a, a, a more unique way or a way that's, um, you know, distinguishes us from everybody else doing it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, past that, a lot of people are looking at platforms that, um, you know, allow you to do that live, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I've already tested that, trying to do that with Zoom with, with the Jazz Mafia crew. There's a couple other um, apps, uh, that I'm, I'm forgetting their names off the top of my head. I was actually reading about it this morning. Um, you know, there's a number of apps that that were kind of rehearsal tools, like re remote rehearsal tools, and they allow you to do that in real time. Yeah. Um, the problem is there's there's kind of this latency issue that you always run up against. Um, right. And so it's basically the technology isn't where you know the demand or or kind of the the to do a live, to do a live show with multiple people in different places, I see. Yep, and you're all hearing each other in real time and responding and to the right. same rhythms and yeah, it, it gets really challenging. Um, and yeah, I guess the technology is not really there yet. So speaking of technology, you run digital projects for the San Francisco Jazz Center, um, which I know you've worked at the Jazz Center for a while and this is kind of the evolution of your job and that you know it's now taken like a much different purpose and tone and role even that the physical space uh, is shut. And just taking a second, uh, owning a physical space myself, you know, I think a lot of spaces thought of their digital presence as um, supplemental or maybe, um, you know, additive or complementary to their offerings, right? The symphony, the ballet, the opera, a lot of your traditional spaces, the jazz center, Manny's, other venues, concert venues. A lot of us are probably now thinking, damn, like, our digital presence can't just be like an add-on, you know what I mean? Like we need to start thinking really critically and essentially about it. So uh, also if folks have questions for us as a musician or as someone that works at the Jazz Center, you can type it in the Q&A box now. 
Um, can you tell us about your role at the Jazz Center now, how it's evolved, and just like what's going on with the Jazz Center? Yeah, actually, I started at SF Jazz as an intern right when I moved to the Bay Area. Um, so didn't, I didn't really have any experience. I didn't want to. I didn't want to place you, but place yourself. Yeah, I mean, no, it's it's fine. Like I, I had no experience. I had no really case other than um, the the way I originally met Manny was through this fellowship program called the Watson Fellowship, and that was an experience that kind of brought me on this path I'm still on. Um, my degree in college was in chemistry. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's like I didn't, I didn't prepare in college for taking a job at, at a nonprofit arts organization. Um, and I wanted to do that because I was obviously passionate about the music, but SF Jazz's mission was very aligned with the, this experience I'd had outside the U.S. Um, you know, learning about how jazz and other music traditions have come together. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I started as an intern quickly after that. I, I took a job in the marketing department and that was kind of all on the media side, got pretty heavily into video in that time. And then about a year, a year and a half ago now, um, I transitioned to a, a new role that was created at SF Jazz uh, called Digital Projects Manager. And basically SF Jazz has been um, doing a lot of research and planning to launch um, a digital product um kind of the 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 vision of it is to um find out a way to take the analog experience that that people have sitting in the hall that people you know physical patrons have at sf jazz and to create an experience that is up to that level but digitally um it's something that's extremely hard to do because you know you can't we've all been at live shows and we've all seen live streams and you know it's they're, they're different experiences I don't yeah. think, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessarily you're trying to match or make them the same. I think there's actually ways that a digital experience can be augmented in some ways than a, than a physical experience. There's certain things that, and insights that you, you're able to share that you might not necessarily be able to relay to a physical audience. Um, it's just to say that it's something that the organization has been researching and investing a lot in um, over the past five, six years, basically since the SF Jazz Center opened in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, it's located at Franklin and Fell in Hayes Valley for those of you who've never been. Um, when the, the center was built, we had, we had an entire video production suite. We have all these, they're called PTZ cameras, point, tilt, zoom. You, it's like robotically controlled cameras um, wow. that one operator can switch between. So, um, you know, the, the, the investment in equipment was there from the beginning. And you know, we, we've been trying to wait for the right moment, both with the organization internally, as well as, um, you know, what our research and findings were showing. And, you know, when this happened, it was kind of, you know, it's now or never, basically. Um, and so we basically within five work days of the shelter in place order wow. uh, going into effect, we launched a weekly digital concert series called Fridays at Five. So we show um, a pre-recorded concert that we've already filmed at SF Jazz every Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. And we stream it and we've built um, a digital membership program. So you can sign up for $5 a month and you get four broadcasts. And then um, we offered it free to our current SF Jazz members. What tech do you um, use for that? Uh, there's a tech called OBS, um, and what basically, our 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 video tech is in San Diego right now, and he, um, you know, works on the file. We get him all the assets. He puts the edit together. We go through all the reviews, and then he uses that to stream via YouTube player onto sfjazz.org. So he's we're grabbing files that are archived at SF Jazz, you know, in San Francisco. They're kind of going through a lot of, a lot of different people are touching it throughout the organization, audio people, video people, marketing people, uh, myself, um, you know, a lot of others. And then he assembles the edit in San Diego and streams it via YouTube and it's embedded on sfjazz.org where you can watch it if you're logged in. How do you feel like, and it's been successful, right? Like thousands of people have been tuning in, right? 
Yeah, so we have over 3,000 new digital members that have signed up in the last month alone. We also have a tip jar, um, and we split 50% of the proceeds from the tip jar with the artist directly. Um, we've raised, I think, over, I don't know, over twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 that go directly to the artists. That's amazing. And it's a testament to the power of the SF Jazz community. But Definitely. I thought, like, so that's a concert experience that is happening with thousands of people from a concert that's already happened, right? And yeah. <laughs> it's basically like tools and marketing and audio and digital files and a paywall basically create a venue business model um, from pre-recorded tracks. And I wonder, and this is a question we've been asking a lot of people, like how do you think all this is gonna affect the music industry and the music consumption industry? Um, I think I, not like how it's gonna affect like local musicians, because folks are gonna wanna see Jazz Mafia play at the Madrone or whatever. And I think that's, that is what it is. But this more kind of like formal consumption of music and arts that, that's happening. And I would put SF Jazz in that bucket of like, you know, the ballet, the symphony, the opera, that kind of thing, like really the big concert venues. It's kind of like almost institutional arts organizations. How do you think this multiple month shutdown and the need to really beef up one's digital uh, assets might affect them in the future? I mean, all, I mean, this crisis aside, it's, it's kind of uh, once in a organization's lifetime opportunity to refocus the entire, not all resources, but a lot of the resources that an organization like SF Jazz or other nonprofits, you know, you mentioned the other performing arts organizations in the city, um, and refocus the entire organization around its digital programs. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we're at least viewing as, um, you know, we're responding to what's happening, first and foremost. But on top of that, we're also thinking about um, how this is actually the launch of SF Jazz's kind of identity and presence, presence in, in digital um, and how we build an audience and um, specifically build an audience outside of the Bay Area. Um, right. SF Jazz is very unique in the programming it does and the way that it, it um, you know, produces and presents this music. Um, I, it, we, we feel like we do it in a very unique way. Um, yeah. and we place value on that. And honestly, the response we've gotten so far is, you know, $5 a month is nothing. People are kind of shocked how, how low of an overhead that is to just enter and watch these shows. So it's, it's been the feedback we've received and kind of the indications we've gotten over this first month alone is, um, that, you know, this is something that we should continue to invest and build upon and, um, this is not going to go away. We're going to figure out a way to make this an ongoing program. Maybe Fridays at 5 p.m. is is not the best time once things open up. You know, a lot of people are probably going out to happy hour or to dinner or getting their weekend started. I hope um, so. I forgot but, what that felt like, but yeah, I hope yeah, so. right. <laughs> but right now, it's it's kind of it's it's been perfect, honestly. Um, and you know, 5 p.m. also allows people on the East Coast to watch. Um, and we've been you know getting more and more people you know, up and down the West Coast, um, but as well, you know, in the Midwest and the East Coast tuning in. So it's... So we have to end in five minutes, and this is a very non-inquisitive audience, it seems. So I'm going to ask about <laughs> it, unless someone has something there, a burning question to ask. Um, what do you think is uh, lost in that, in, in the digital experience of a, li of, of a live, of an event that happens live, but is it consumed digitally? And, and then I'm going to turn it around and also say, what do you think is a, uh, what do you think is gained? What do you think is, and you've kind of mentioned it already, but like, give me both sides of the coin here. What are you losing by experiencing an art like jazz digitally? And what are you actually able to gain by doing it that way? Uh, there's, there's some, uh, I mean, I, I would say this for all music. Um, there's something that's, you can't really replicate in, in the experience you have. I mean, we've all been to live shows, hopefully. And there's something special and, and kind of weird in some ways about just getting into a room with a bunch of people you don't know and all quietly sharing this experience together and being hopefully touched in, in many ways, going through an entire emotional spectrum. Um, 
you know, feeling in, in jazz, you know, we call them these moments of transcendence, but where kind of everything just aligns up in the most beautiful way. And, um, you know, the music is just, is just happening at such a high, it's kind of just on this higher plane, you know, and it takes, it takes you to that place, you know. Um, that is something I, I don't think can be, you know, replicated digitally or replaced. Um, the sense of community you feel um, physically in that space is maybe, is maybe hard to obtain digitally, but even, I mean, to be honest, like even within the chats that we have, so we have like a live chat box that, that is alongside these streams that we do. And even, I mean, in that you, you feel like people can talk about the music and share insights and, and ask questions. We've had artists tune in and, and they've been involved in the chat as well. And, you know, it, in that way, it's, it's when I said, you know, a digital experience can be augmented, you know, over a physical experience. How many times, you know, in, in a live concert, are you able to both watch and hear and listen and, and enjoy the concert, but at the same time, be able to ask that artist questions in that moment. Hey, what's that, like, what's that guitar pedal you're using? Or like, hey, like, what, what was your inspiration behind this song? What's it about, you know? And these are things maybe that the artist might share, you know, in their remarks between songs, but it allows you, I think, to, to get deeper into the music um, in ways you wouldn't, you know, necessarily be able to do if you were physically at the concert. Hopefully you leave a physical concert and you're like, man, I want to check out that album, man. I want to like, you know, learn more about this artist and their, all their music and, you know, what, what they're doing and hear more. But um, this allows you to, to kind of go deeper in the moment. So I think, I think that's like one clear way that we've seen a digital experience can actually, um, you know, provide more, um, you know, just in a different way. I would also just, I would just repeat, so I'm, you know, you know, my philosophy around this, at least before this pandemic was very clearly, you know, I built a physical space because I believe politics and our civic life as much as possible should be interfaced with in person because it's nuanced and it's delicate and it's complicated and uh, scary for a lot of people. And I think the internet sometimes brings out the worst in us. And um, I've seen so many beautiful moments of transcendence, political transcendence in my space. Uh, and so I come from a very anti-digital lens when it comes to these things. And what I do have to say is, um, and, I, and, and if I could choose, I would choose all physical 100%. But um, I believe in the quality of our programming. We've been able to bring world leaders into Manny's uh, and certainly national leaders and political folks. And um, we've punched way above our weight. Similar SF jazz singers brought in the world's best jazz musicians to the corner of Fell and uh, God. Franklin and Fell. Franklin and Fell, <laughs> um, whatever it is. Um, and uh, I, would, I would only be able to have, you know, 200 people in the room. You know, if a really well done digital platform, you could expand your base by a lot. I mean, thousands of people tuned into my conversation with Michael Pollan. You know, I never would have been able to do that in Manny's. And um, I guess we did have a live stream, but it wasn't very good. So there's pros and cons. And I think you and I are both in the same boat where, you know, we both love and appreciate and thirst for the in person. And I think now we're starting to understand that there's a somewhat inevitability on the digital. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, yeah, there's, there's nothing that quite, and we've already talked about this, like it's the, there's no way you can replace that, like being there in the moment and feeling like, you know, this moment might never happen again. Even if you film that moment, it's not gonna be the same as sitting in the room. Um, right. But I mean, we, we're, we're kind of talking about this and looking in a way of like, and I know you've already been live streaming a lot of your talks, which is awesome. It allows a lot, a lot of, yeah, I mean, it allows more accessibility to um, these important dialogues that your your space was built for. I mean, I've I've sat in Manny's many times and enjoyed talks, and I've I, I can't say I've watched too many live streams, um, but being being there is really important. Um, but I think this kind of time that we're in and however long it lasts I think people are going to be more used to experiencing 
and receiving this information or receiving, you know, and experiencing live concerts um, in a digital way. And in some ways it's gonna open it up and allow, you know, Manny's SF Jazz and a lot of other people that put on these events and, and have a compelling way of capturing and sharing it digitally. Um, mm -hmm. A way to, to, to scale it past, you know, I know you reference your capacity, SF Jazz has a 700 seat hall, you know? And that's kind of perfect, it's been perfect for us. But what if there's on top of that 2000 people that would pay to watch this show as it happened live, you know? Right. And that's something that could benefit the artists too. We do have um, to, so we did to close Ross, but I just wanna, I wanna, <laughs> I'm gonna cut you the fuck off. And I'm gonna ask you Katie's final question, okay? Sure. Who is an artist that you've never, that has never performed at San Francisco Jazz you'd like to see? either digitally or in person? So many artists have played at SF Jazz. I kind of have crossed out a lot of... That's a good question. Um, and it's funny, even like a lot of the musicians when I was traveling a lot that I wanted to see again or play music with again in some way, a lot of them actually come and play to SF Jazz. And I've kind of, I'll trip them out and just be like, hey, what's up? You know, just be like, had no idea I was in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I had a quicker answer. <laughs> Maybe an amendment to this question would be, who's one person would you see again that's performed? Like if you could only have one person come back to SF Jazz, who would it be? Come on now. Can you have like- I would maybe, I would, I would, so I'm just gonna throw this out there and I, I don't know if it'll happen again, but um, Wayne, Wayne Shorter is, is, you know, one of the greatest all time jazz musicians. If you've never heard of him and you're listening to this right now, you should definitely check him out. He's kind of someone who's played with everybody and has been kind of a, a living legend and elder statesman of, of the music and, you know, championed and, and mentored a lot of people. And he's played SF jazz a number of times, um, but he's getting pretty old and he's not traveling that much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and he's someone that I would, you know, see, I would, you know, I would drop anything I was doing to see um, if, if the chance arose again. And he's somebody that, um, can really transport you. Um, yeah, I've, and, and in a way that's very challenging to, to do, especially in jazz. I've put Wayne Shorter's, uh, a, a link to one of his tracks in the chat box, if anyone's interested. Um, I don't know, but it's called Infant Eyes. I assume that's a big track. So I put that in the chat box. Um, a nice real one. Quick, for those who are here, I just want to, quickly plug Manny's and, and ask you if you're willing to become a sponsor. Um, just like at San Francisco Jazz, we are shut and we do need your help. Um, you know, I watched the press conferences today. I'm sure you did too. It's going to be a long, slow road to getting back up on track. And so if you could please go to joinit.org slash o slash Manny's. It's also in the chat box. You can click on the link, the join it link to become a sponsor of Manny's. You can go to sfjazz at sfjazz.org and donate. Yeah, is that true? Um, great. I just made that up, but I'm so glad it's right. You can become a did they should become a digital member. Sign up for Fridays at five. What's how do they do that? Where do they go? Uh, just it'll be on the landing page, should be pretty clear. SFJazz.org. Let's see here. Um, easy Fridays at five, right there. We're gonna put the link uh, in the chat box and you can become a digital member. I will become a digital member. This sounds awesome. I'm super into it. Um, you can click on the, in the chat box to become a sponsor of Manny's. You can also click on the chat box to become a member of San Francisco Jazz. Thank you, Ross, for being a artist and for keeping the arts alive in San Francisco. Always a pleasure talking with you, Manny. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs>